Hello everyone, welcome back to another bonus episode of the Mouthy Money podcast. I'm joined yet again by Christopher Chute, uh, Head of Consumer Finance at MRM, to talk with me through what's going on out there in the in the news, the media, the world of money and finance, uh, and everything in between, with our personal gripes to add in. Um, <laughs> it seems to be thematic in this little catch-up yeah. we're doing. It's, it, it is just a chance for us to grind our own axes, but also talk about money and the wider economic situation as well, Ed, so we can just Absolutely. keep complaining. <laughs> and speaking of that wider economic situation, we're going big today with something big happening uh, on Thursday, uh, and that's interest rates, isn't it? Yeah, big big news coming in uh, on Thursday. Well, it, it feels like a real watershed in terms of how things have been going Again, in the ongoing battle against inflation, on the 21st, we've got the MP MPC coming back and letting us know whether they feel it's right for us to start trimming interest rates, um, which would be a signal to everybody, mortgage borrowers, investment markets, that perhaps the worst might be over. Uh, some, some of you who are more careful watchers of the news may have seen that uh, there have been predictions that there's going to be there was going to be loads of uh, rate cuts four or five this year. That's been scaled back somewhat as inflation's proven pretty difficult to budge. And then we finally got to the point in the summer where uh, a lot of uh, market watchers were predicting that we were going to get two cuts this year, and one of those was supposed to be coming on Thursday, which uh, which I have a lot of personal story in as well because I am in the middle of remortgaging it which is a bit of a pain or it's a bit of a painful uh, process, not because of the people that I'm working with, by the way, who are absolutely fine. My, my mortgage is with Santander and I'm actually working with the two really great brokers, uh, a company called London Money, who are helping me to find out what the best rate, are, rate is. Sorry, um, But uh, I sort of got this gut feel based on all the reading and stuff that we did not too long ago that I don't think this rate cut's coming. And so yeah. uh, I had a look at the product transfer stuff with my own lender, Santander, and saw a deal that whilst more than what we're paying at the moment, I thought that's that's one I could deal with. Then left it, thought, well, that'll be there for a while then. And then checked back on again two weeks later and it had gone and had a sort of mild panic. Uh, but luckily it reemerged. I don't know what happened, but it reemerged. So I jumped all over it and sort of lined that up. But... Um, as uh, as I've always sort of thought, you need to kind of hedge your bets. So you can change your, uh, you don't have to tie yourself into that deal provided you give your lender enough notice beforehand. So I've sort of agreed in principle to that. And then I have asked these guys at the brokerage to keep their eyes peeled to see if anything else comes. And obviously this Thursday will be a big indication as to whether or not that process starts because we don't have an NPC meeting in July. Uh, so if not, then I'll probably stick with the original rate that I've got and move on from there. If there is something happening, then I'm hoping that those guys are going to have a little look for, look for me and see if they can find something better in the wider market out there. So, yeah, it's uh, it does feel like big news personally, but also big news for the for the wider economy for a lot lots of mortgage borrowers that want to see those signs that things are starting to return towards a new normal, whatever that may be. Um, and also, you know, investment markets have priced a lot of this stuff in already, as you would expect. But actually, I think it would it would boost confidence if we were to see the UK, well, the Bank of England following the um, the European Central Market, who had a cut last month. So yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot going on, and there's a lot of will they won't they at the moment. I mean, um, like you said, ECB have cut already. Canadians, I think, cut as well. So we're not even going to be the first to do it at this point if we do cut. But there's political aspects to it as well now, which nobody was thinking about, you know, a month ago, in that if they do cut rates, it's probably good for Rishi Sunak, you know, it, giving out, you know, he can he can claim a victory, giving relief to, to households because they've brought inflation back down and that kind of thing. Um I don't know how much control he actually has over that, Ed, to be honest well, with you. But <laughs> that, that's never stopped a politician claiming, claiming, claiming a victory. Claiming, yeah, no. claiming a victory in, in the past. Fair point. Um, Fair point. I don't think Rishi's any different in this in that regard. <laughs> um, blaming external events when it goes wrong and taking taking personal responsibility when it goes right. No, um, <laughs> I mean, your situation is is it sounds is familiar actually. Uh, funnily enough, Joe Noble. Uh, was talking about it in the Sunday Times. She was saying how she rejected a 2% rate, I think it was, a, a while back. 
uh, or something like that. And then was actually extremely happy to get a 5.99% on her remortgage this time around kind of thing, because that's where we are with the more the market. And it's kind of, you know, the, the, the normal of, you know, and I remember this using this phrase during the pandemic a lot, which, um, I, I, it's fallen out favor, but I might be trying to bring it back. New normal. The new normal is very different now than it was a, a little while ago. I mean, I was speaking to you from a position of a person who got on a, got on a five year mortgage at three percent in twenty twenty two. So I'm just kind of right. Smug. Right. Are you smug? Are you smug? Ed? You look smug. <laughs> no, I'm. I'm very. Uh, I'm very humble, Chris. <laughs> You're not rubbing it in at all. About a lucky decision made in the throes, <laughs> the, the throes of the cost of living crisis. There we go. Um, no, but I mean, you know, look, 2027 when we remortgage is probably going to give us a massive kicking. Um, I don't think they're going to go back to 3% anytime soon. So, um, yeah, we shall, we shall see. Uh, my feeling on it is they'll probably, well, it's hard, isn't it? They, they always act within abundance of caution, so I'd say they probably just leave it this time. But this would be the last one that they leave, I reckon. I'd reckon. I mean, I'd yeah. happily, eat my happily eat my words next week. But um, that's yeah, my gut feel as well. I think they'll leave it. And uh, to be honest with you, it was something, and uh, you know, this is based on no fact or I'm not claiming any insight or anything, but just the feeling around, you know, when we got to Q1 spring sort of time, I was just thinking this this isn't going to come. So you need to start thinking about what you're going to do now and have a look around. And so I'm kind of pleased that I did really. And we'll see how it kind of pans out but there definitely is this idea of a new normal emerging and what that looks like and what so i'm looking at a two-year fix for obvious reasons because i think there will be a, a slight tick down but to where how much what does that mean for my long-term planning so we don't know the answers to those questions ed so that's why we've decided to do a bit of a deeper dive haven't we we're going to go do a mortgage takeover week um in a couple yeah. of weeks time so watch this space and we're going to be speaking to the likes of digital mortgage broker tembo uh, the mortgage lender Perenna, West One, they're a lender as well. Just getting a sense of them and some others as well, some other mortgage experts about where they think this new normal is, what it means for mortgage rates, what it means for property prices, whether there'll be some kind of wiggle room or some in ingenious new products that need people push out that might be helpful to the likes of you and I where we, well, when you get to your point in three years' time and I get to mine in two years' time from here. So, yeah. Um, yeah, do keep your eyes peeled for that. And there'll be more about that if you are listening to this. But I think uh, it is a really interesting inflection point for the mortgage market now, I think, and uh, where it goes from here and how we respond to what this new situation is is going to look like, I think is going to be crucial for everyone, lenders, brokers, borrowers. Um, so yeah, watch this space, I think. Mm. Speaking of things that are coming up, we've actually got uh, we've actually got, got our first guest coming oh, yeah. on the various podcasts, <laughs> don't we? <laughs> Yes, I do. But I'm tell it, tell us about that. And this is a running theme now. I think we're something we've talked about last time, and we're going to keep talking about more about because it's interesting. Yeah, we've um, we've been we're quite interested in this idea of the British ISA. There was a bit of coverage in the papers this week about you mentioned in the Sunday Times. I know David Rachie did a piece in it, but there's been a lot of chatter in a lot of quarters about about this, and um, it's it's interesting because we uh, do we need it? It's is the big question. Um, and to answer that, we're going to ask Tom Selby of AJ Bell to come on in a couple of weeks' time to, to talk about that. I think the um, the broad feeling from Tom and others, uh, so there's there's some guys at Saxo Bank, I think William Masters came out and said some stuff uh, at Saxo Bank about it as well, about how it, it's got positive intentions, but it does seem to be sort of best will in the world not going to be a great idea. Um, and there's also reasons for that, it seems, in terms of, well, what are we trying to incentivize people to do? Uh, invest in the UK stock market. For the background, I think a lot of this is around the health, the relative health of, of, of the UK stock market, which seems, despite hitting record highs, which is confusing to me as a close watch of the UK stock market recently, there is a sense that it's sort of losing its allure globally and that UK, the UK market is underperforming others, like the US, for example, who has all the big tech providers and all that kind of stuff. Um, so... This is an attempt, I think, to encourage us all to buy British, as we touched on last week with financial repression conversation and what, where that led to. But the problem is that we're not sure it will do that because I think it gives you a 20K allowance and then an extra 5K for investing in stocks and shares in the UK. But most people don't use their full ISA allowance. They can do that in the normal ISA anyway. And those that do will probably just sell their UK holdings and use the extra 5K. <laughs> 
it yeah. to get UK exposure that way. So yeah, it doesn't seem that well thought through. Ed. I don't know what you think, but um, we're going to get we're going to get Tom to come on and give us give it both barrels. But what are your views? Well, we can run even deeper on this and actually ask ourselves how useful is the entire ISA regime at all when nobody's coming anywhere close to their annual limits kind of thing. Mm. Mm. And I I used to have more sympathy for that line of argument, but actually I think um, I think having a, a lower annual allowance would be a good incentive to get people to try and target that allowance more, and that's why I like things like the lifetime ISA because the lifetime ISA you have a four grand limit in it and that seems like a more eminently achievable target to aim for and push like a push target rather than 20 grand which is like well i'm never going to fill that so you know who cares but 20 grand is too is, is too low to be useful to the ultra wealthy so you know it it, it it exists for somebody to spend 30 years putting money into because in 30 years time then you're sitting on a massive tax-free you know pile of money and i think politically it's extremely difficult to come after something like an ISA because it's a simple product. So I don't think, unlike with pensions where, you know, we talk about tsunami slicing and all these different things that happen to pensions and all the tweaks that get made by different governments, I think what is so effective about an ISA is it's a very simple product and it's very hard to muck with it uh, and actually very hard to, to come after in tax terms and that kind of thing other than changing the limits, the announcers. So... That doesn't kind of doesn't answer the question at all about the Brit ISA. I think the Brit, a Brit ISA is mostly, mostly a waste of time because you should probably be invested in a you know massive global, you know selection of companies, not just the UK. Um, I'd also try and avoid putting my conspiracy theory hat back on, which we talked about last week, which was encouraging people to buy stuff locally is just a good way of uh, uh, housing money locally, which is cynically not necessarily the best thing for an investor. Um, so yeah, very on the fence. Keen to hear what Tom has to say about it because I know they've got quite strong views at AJ Bell um, about the thing, but I won't spoil it. Basically, <laughs> um, I think yeah, I think this brings us on to what our kind of next thing we wanted to chat about, wasn't it? Which is the kind of again talking a little bit about uh, taxes and tax issues and that kind of stuff. Um, and actually, a really interesting article. Again, uh, we're, we're kind of giving the Sunday Times a big fat name check this week. <laughs> <laughs> uh, other newspapers we, are available yeah can you tell we've both been reading the same paper the weekend? Um, yeah it was this article actually by uh, a guy who's I, he's i don't know he's been around for a while but he's suddenly um become i follow him on linkedin and on twitter and does loads of really interesting stuff a guy called dan needle who's a he's a tax expert basically uh, he's done some really good stuff around these uh, these companies that, that do like really dodgy advice on like uh, landlord tax avoidance schemes and stuff. Really, really interesting, worth looking at. Anyway, he had a piece in the Sunday Times which I thought you'd find well, you'd find interesting. I found certainly found interesting. Basically, he, he, he's positing if I were Chancellor, what would I do? And nine taxes that he'd basically get rid of. Uh, and it makes for interesting reading related to the Brit, Brit ISA thing. I think something that the investment industry, I know II, Interactive Investor, are quite big on this. Myron, who who I do regular podcasts with, they want to get rid of stamp duty on shares. Um, mm. I know, so that's one of the ones he wants to get rid of. Uh, he'd also get rid of stuff like employee national insurance, which is a bad autonomy policy, um, which is quite interesting. So he agrees with them on that. Then other stuff like stamp duty or property, uh, they, then other weird ones like you've never heard of, like bearer instrument duty, which apparently accrues no income for the treasury, but nobody bothered to abolish. So yeah, really interesting. I think, again, talking to that thread that we've talked about before of kind of taxes creating strange outcomes. Mm -hmm. Um and it's just a very, I don't know, I don't, I don't see any of the political parties tackling it, but it's just kind of like, these are things that just don't provide good outcomes they just create you know bad bad situations um so let's let's bid them off i'd be interested to see if, if the Labour party paid attention to it but yeah interesting one from dan needle basically yeah i was reading i was reading through quite a few sort of obviously the the manifestos which we've been calling for for a while have, have landed so that's great so we can have a look at those and i was struck by how little difference there was really between yeah. b both you know it's like obviously the vat on private schools thing has come out and um you know uh, 
from my point of view as a state school educated person who um is probably going to have the same for my kids didn't really feel you know that one doesn't hit me um so and i also feel that it's uh, it's probably fair um but even just the amount it's going to raise relative to what the spending plans are likely to be it just seemed to be a drop in the ocean and we talked about sort of on a consumer level about how the tax system is delivering strange outcomes and is hitting, hitting the wrong targeting the wrong parts of the po- population with taxes that feel like they were designed for someone else the outcome from it from some of these tweaks as well seems to be so little compared to the airtime and the other impacts that it has uh in a sort of conversation like this it just it just it seems to me like they're they're, they're cigar- cigarette paper thin a lot of these kind of differences and while they're worthy of debate no doubt they are going to impact people i'm not suggesting they're not i do think if we're looking at the major structural issues in in the uk full stop then we need to raise a lot more money don't we well, and it's, it's the only mm. option really to borrow uh you, you know it seems strange to me i'll hear you with i'll hear you with some fun facts here the the well the main one being that um the government takes about one trillion pounds a year in tax now, tax revenue. Right, a trillion okay. pounds. So if you consider the the you know the private school VAT tax exemption, or is it going to raise like a few billion quid? I mean, it's an it's an absolute nothing, absolute nothing in comparison to to you know the overall and the big three hitters there in that one trillion. Um, is is income tax, NICS, and VAT. So income tax is about it's about a third of what the government brings in. Just looking at some facts here from the IFS, uh, NICS is a little bit less than that, and then I think VAT is about seventeen, eighteen percent, or something. Actually, NICS is about eighteen percent as well. So you know, well over half of the of, of the tax the government brings in comes from three three different things, and the rest is just you know effectively you know a sideshow and this is the thing right is the i mean the tories to be in fairness to them are the ones who are talking about getting rid of you know nicks entirely basically because it's a tax on employment it's just not it's not and this is the thing that dan needle talks about his article it's a tax on employment it's not very efficient it just you know you're just making employment harder and 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 you know leaving people with less money basically it's a tax on wages and that kind of stuff um but the labor labor who are almost certainly at this point going to be the next government are talking about you know a load of assortment of random other things and they're not talking about the big things and they're just trying to to to, to not you know actively avoid talking about it and say no we're not going to do anything with it and then it's like well what are you actually going to do because uh, this this stuff that you have a plan for it's not going to raise enough. It's just not. So yeah, I think there's lots of questions there. But then, like you say, I don't see a huge amount of difference ultimately between the two. It feels like it needs to be uh, more rude for us, doesn't it? Ed? Yeah, just <laughs> descending, descending into really cynical stuff here. But, um, there we are. There we are. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think it's quite an interesting one. I think. I, I think. It, 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 it the whole area of tax does need a new a fresh eye and a rethink it feels like many parts of like we said before uk society uk economy needs that it's it, it's all in need of a I, I was listening to something not too long ago um and somebody said that there's this idea that britain's broken which feels a little bit dramatic it's probably not that bad but actually it's kind of stuck in second or third gear and actually, I think what we need to do is just have stop, have a little look at what we've got under the hood, really, and how things are running, and then see if we can fine tune a few things and then get going again. I think, and that's easy for me to say. It's a massive thing to overhaul, a hugely complicated, and causes problems. And if people do, if you do kind of unintended out, outcomes, we talked about that previously. But there is a sense that some more imagination about how we structure all of these things, rather than repeating the same things over and over again, like having several different types of ISA, like having you know, a, a slight tweak on this tax rate or a little shaving a bit off here and adding a little bit on top there, whether or not there's something that could be a little bit more long-term that could come out of the, these conversations. It doesn't feel like we're going to get it this uh, this election. Um, hasn't felt like we're going to get it for quite some time, really. But actually, that it could have huge benefits for all of us if we just had a rethink about what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we're doing it, and make those taxes more precise 
uh, and clear on what the outcomes of them are supposed to be. I think that would be that would be uh, that would be a good place to start. But uh, it's easy for me to say that pontificating here, Ed, it's quite hard to well, make that happen. Yeah, I mean, coming coming back to what we started with the the thing about interest rates and 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 actually, I mean, one of the things which I mean, I, I'm. I have been convinced by some of my reading, particularly a book called The Price of Time by Edward Chancellor, which I think I've talked to you about in the past, but really, mm. really interesting book about how interest rates effectively are the best way we have of of, of pricing the fu- in, in the future, almost. And basically, interest rates have been too low for the past decade, and the, and the outcome of that is uh, too many businesses. And we're seeing it now. We're seeing particularly in like things like private equity and stuff like that, where... Um, these companies, you know, did like debt fueled takeovers and all this kind of stuff, and now suddenly they're finding they're having to pay back debt at much higher levels and this kind of thing. Basically, low interest rates creates a zombie economy because lots of businesses that are profitable are able to get by by just taking on debt and then paying off that debt. And now higher rates are going to start clearing out a lot of the dead wood. And actually. It's painful now, but in five years' time, the economy is going to look a lot leaner and a lot fitter, basically, because higher rates has a way of clearing out the dead wood. Um, and I mean, there are examples of this in the past. We're obviously in a slightly different, you know, area today where we've had this kind of historic low rates. But um, as painful as it is for households and businesses, um, then not necessarily the worst thing having it stay slightly higher for, for longer. Um, I'll commend that book to anybody who's interested in the topic. It's it's a very interesting uh, read. It goes into a lot of the history of interest rates, which you will know Chris is a uh, particular uh, joy of mine, looking at the history of money, because I'm like that. I'm boring. <laughs> we can learn a lot from it, can't you? But I, but I think, I think no, listen, on that, though, if, you, if, you, if in five years' time, to your point, we've got an economy that's motoring and the deadwood's been cleared out, then you don't want the tax regime to be playing catch-up. You wanted people to be thinking in those terms rather than, you know, bickering over, like you said, which what are essentially small shavings. Let's look at the whole thing in in, in the round and maybe look to to redesign and simplify and go from there. And it's interesting that the the, the article isn't the you you're talking about is isn't about you know it's was it eight taxes nine taxes I'd get rid of immediately just overcomplicated painful not delivering the outcomes that we want. It's like and you know and I've, I've said before my leanings are you know probably center left to declare an interest here and you know i'm i'm, I'm in favor of a, a sensible well thought out well uh put together tax system i think that's redistribution of wealth is important for all the reasons for a, we want for a coherent society but if it's not working <laughs> then it needs special attention on that i think um but speaking on things that aren't working as well haven't you had some energy providers <laughs> Yeah, we've been talking off. I, I, I wanted this one to come onto the podcast, listeners, because uh, yeah, I'm sure you'll all be familiar with uh, the pain of dealing with these guys. But Ed, what's been going on? What's been grinding? Yeah, your I, so I wrote my column uh, on Happy Money about this last week. Um, it's an interesting problem, actually. It is one that I think is unique. It's not unique to me, but it's it's unique to our situation. So um, obviously, we, so our, our son was born last October um it, at the end just towards the end of October and obviously that's going into winter so your energy bills and water bills obviously tend to go up in winter time because you basically you're spending more time at home and that kind of thing um but we had our direct debit set at you know one level and he was born and then what happened was our energy usage went up because we're doing more like washing we're having to like sterilize bottles and all this kind of stuff and then our water bills went up uh, went up well not sorry not bills our water usage went up as well i think roughly between the water and the energy so that's gas and electric or it both usage levels went up about 10 percent now what didn't happen is the because what these companies don't do this is they didn't increase our direct debits by 10 percent to match that despite our obvious uptick in behavior our usage uptick Mm -hmm. so what happened and this is you know to this is my you know my fault um in the first instance is that our bills went up slightly and i didn't pay any attention to it so over the course of about six or seven months we suddenly accrued deficits on both our water and energy accounts and that was sh- sh- purely just from using a bit more energy than you know estimated and using a bit more water than estimated. 
So suddenly within the space of about two weeks of each other in May, um, I had uh, an email from my water provider saying, hello, you're not on track with your bills, so we're putting your direct debit up. Uh, and then basically the exact same email, email from the energy provider. Um, now I'll give you the figures very quickly. So um, our water company tried to hike our bill from £50 a month to around about to £100 a month. Ooh. Uh, and the energy provider tried to hike our energy bill from, which is gas and electric, from 130 a month to 200 a month, which, you know, a month on a monthly increase level, it's quite a big, you know, it's not it's not a fun hit to take. On, on, on uh, a 10% when... increase in your usage, Ed? Yeah, so on I'll that... explain why, why is this... It sounds a bit naughty to me. So this is it, right? Okay, they hiked roughly their monthly dire debit was hiked roughly to double the level of which the so if, if i were to increase my bill in order to pay what we're using and pay off the deficit over 12 months each one had hiked the bill by double that so i this is what i did is i did the calculations yeah i did the calculations and i figured out okay if i'm gonna pay for what we're using and factor in things like the energy cap going down plus paying off uh, what we owe the provider over 12 months it was going to be about 160 something quid for the energy and yeah about half you know of the increase that they'd actually put on it so what was going to happen was we were going to be paying 2400 pounds on an energy bill when we were only using about 1600 pounds worth of energy and then we had a 500 pound deficit but that was still far and away behind what we should have been paying back so they're basically taking extra money and using me like a piggy bank no oh, uh, uh, massive pet hate of this mine ed, uh, mine ed to be honest they just yeah, come in yeah. and taking your hard-earned money and then you're having to fight to get it back i've had this example yeah. myself in the past it's so just, yeah. yeah they're just setting it at unrealistic levels and anyway, the, the only takeaway i'd give to you know to anyone listening here is is when you get these kind of increases do the sums mm. look at how much you owe how much you should be paying you know, and, and take your case to them because in both instances with the water provider and the energy provider, I called both up and I was able to negotiate it to a much more reasonable level. Now we are paying more because we've used more and we've recruited deficit and I accept that, that's fine. But it's like, I'm not going to accept these massive hikes that you're imposing on me. I, I'm going to, you know, fight my corner here a little bit. They're counting um, on that inertia, Ed, though, aren't they? They are counting. And you can't help but feel yeah, they can be, you're, be, you're being cheated. Is the word that well, you'd use. And both, yeah? and both markets here, right? Water, they operate an effective monopoly because you can't mm. pick your water provider. You get, mm. you, they have regional monopolies. Um, so anybody who knows where I live can guess who my provider is, but I won't say it. Um, then energy, I mean, you can switch, but I mean, does it make a difference? No, because we have a price cap. So everybody just charges just below the price cap. There's very little com competition in the market. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know. You just got to stand up for yourself, you know. Don't let them get away with it, basically. Um, and yeah, that was what I took away from it. So I and I've, I've figured out that that I'm I'm going to be the best partner about five hundred quid better off because I stood up to their you know bill on effectively bill gouging. And so, you yeah. put that into your Brit ISA. Fantastic work, well done. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> have you? So you've uh, written which, an article on this, have you? With uh, yeah, it's on yeah. the Money website. So anybody who wants to read a little bit more about that, please do head there and take a look and let me know any experiences you had you've had yourselves probably be interested to hear it good stuff fantastic i think that wraps, that wraps us up doesn't it chris um, yeah it does it does i think yep we uh we're very much enjoying these and we'll keep doing them so thank you everybody for listening thank you chris my pleasure cheers ed Obviously, do catch everything we do on social media. We're now on YouTube. You can listen on Apple, Spotify as well. Uh, and obviously, check out Mouthy Money newsletter and website for more. Thank you and goodbye.